You may recall in kind of the breakdown of, of the book of Romans, the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Rome, the first three chapters, about halfway through chapter three, he talks about condemnation. He talks about the true state of things and the depravity of the human heart and how every single one of us desperately need a savior. We may not think we do. We may not realize we do. But truth is we are lost without Jesus. And Paul lays out that case. And then beginning about verse 23 of chapter 3, he gets into salvation. He describes it. He defines it. He lays it out in such explicit terms. What it is that God does, how he saves people, how he then starts to sanctify and cleanse and alter them. And we'll see more of that this morning. And that runs all the way through chapter 8. And if you were to, and I'll talk more about this next week, but if you were to go from the end of chapter 8 directly to the first verse of chapter 12, the flow would be perfect. You could take chapters 19 and 11 completely out and feel like you hadn't skipped a beat. And Paul could have done that. But he stops. And in Romans 9, he starts to talk about something so deeply personal to him, and that is his own people, Israel. So that's where I wanted to go. I wanted to bring things from our, from our tour. I wanted to talk about God's parallel plans. What I didn't understand growing up, what many people don't understand, is God has a plan for the church and he has a plan for Israel. And both are working consecutively, side by side. And both are going to come to full fruition. He's going to reveal in a magnificent way. But we can't go there yet. Uh, Part of the reason is I had to spend half a day cleaning my office from the work of vandals and miscreants. (laughs) If you don't know about this... I walked into an office that was saran-wrapped, aluminum-foiled, uh, books upside down, turned around, the thing, I, golf clubs hanging from the ceiling, and I don't even golf. <laughs> anyway, I felt the love. Right there. I never want to feel that love again. Um, no, the truth is coming back, and literally on the plane, I was, I was praying, and I was reading, and I was looking ahead and, and studying chapter 9, and I realized that if we were to skip ahead to chapter 9, that we would risk putting the cart before the horse. Or, as Paul might put it, putting the wild olive branch before the root. So I want to wait just one week. We'll come back to it. We'll, we'll get into chapter 9 next Sunday. And for this morning and for Wednesday night, we're going to spend the rest of our time finishing out Romans chapter 8. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Romans 8. Capish? Super duper. All right. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans eight twenty-eight. And we know that God causes all things... To work together for good to those who love God. To those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you, Lord, that you had the foreknowledge, as it were, the wisdom to put these things down in writing. From Genesis through Revelation, I thank you for every word that you had placed in the scriptures. I thank you, Father, for protecting it across thousands of years to bring to us that we might read and study and know it this morning. I thank you for the clarity in it, Lord. I thank you for how it stands up. And I pray this morning that you would change our hearts by the work of your spirit and the word that is before us. And help, Lord, help us to understand Give us a spirit of revelation today and change us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, on the first morning of our tour, I came down for breakfast and I saw Roni, our tour guide, Roni Winter. Fantastic. Best tour guide in Israel. And that's not just me saying that. He's got a reputation. He is amazing. And so I, I, I walked up to him and I said, hey, Roni, how'd you sleep? And he said, oh, he said, like a baby. Mm-hmm. I woke every hour and cried a little bit. (laughs) 
You see, Roland was on week four of six straight weeks without bread. He's on a non-bread diet. He was running our entire tour eating power bars that he got from a U.S. Costco. He was thankful for those at least. But he was always hungry. You need to understand, going without bread in Israel is like going without pasta in Italy. It's like going without poutine in Canada. I mean, you just don't do it. You know what poutine is? Okay, it's French fries with gravy and cheese, and it's weird. It's just weird, those Canadians. you got to love them. But all the way through the trip, I'd look over at Roni, and, and he'd say, Oh, I'm so hungry. I'm just so hungry. I'm like, eat a power bar, man. <laughs> he wanted bread. And he kept confessing to me how much he was just hungry for good bread. He even directed Cheryl and I to a, a place, a food court. We ended up eating on the very last night of the tour. But early on in the tour, Cheryl and I went there, a place called Sorona in Tel Aviv. And it's this indoor food court of all these chefs and these amazing different foods you can eat. And we had an amazing burger there in Sorona, a cheeseburger, which you're not supposed to have because it ain't kosher. Cheese and meat together, you just don't do in Israel. But Tel Aviv, you know, Tel Aviv's not kosher. So we went to this place, and we got these burgers with melted Gouda on top. Uh, on top. And it, it came with these homemade, home-baked buns. In and out would be in trouble if this place opened up in the United States. I mean, amazing, amazing. The buns were so good. And I, I was thinking about how there is nothing like good bread. Nothing. My family did a diet where we had to kind of swear off bread for, for a while, and it was painful. I mean, you give me good bread and oil, and I'll, I'll be happy for days. There's nothing like good bread. No wonder Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He chose that one substance, that, that food that is a staple for life. He said that in John 6, 48. I am the bread of life. It is the first of seven I am statements that Jesus made. You Bible students know connecting himself with the Father who called himself the great I am. I am that I am. And Jesus said, and I am the bread of life. Bread is sustaining. And bread is satisfying. And it's strengthening. And it can even be soothing. A nice piece of bread. God's will is like good bread. God's will is like good bread. In that it is sustaining. His purposes in our lives, satisfying, strengthening, even soothing. God's will is like good bread. But let me clarify something about God's will, which is what we're going to look at and consider in these few verses. God's will is His will. The purpose of God is His own. It is not about me. It is not about you. It is not about anyone else. You need to know, dear fellowship, this church does not exist for me or any other pastor or leader or minister or servant. We are not here to leave our mark. We're not here to be a, a footprint on Whidbey Island to, to grow a vast empire of religiosity. We are not here to, to make our stamp or to imprint ourselves. We are here to point people to Jesus for the purpose of His glory. And that is it. Jesus and His glory. See, Paul wrote in Ephesians 1.5, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the, get this, according to the kind intention of His will. I love that phrase. Because God's will is His greatest kindness. And Paul writes to the praise of His glory. The glory of His grace which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved, that is Jesus Christ. God's will is His will, and it is like good bread for you, for me. Bread typically now takes some combination of ingredients. If you want to make bread, you're going to need butter and flour and salt and shortening and sugar and, and some kind of yeast along with water. And you mix all of that up, and somehow, I don't know how because I've never made bread, but it makes bread. So with the kind intention of God's will in mind, I want to consider what I think Paul lays out before us as the primary ingredients of God's purpose. The primary ingredients of His will. 
In these three verses, verse 28 through 30, Paul lists six different ingredients of God's intended will and purpose for our lives. Walk through them with me. The first one is foreknowledge. Ingredient number one, as we look at these, foreknowledge, verse 29, tells us, for those whom he foreknew. Which simply means he knew you before you knew him. He knew all about you before you knew anything of him. He understood you before you began to understand him. And even if you don't understand him, he understands you fully. He has foreknown. He has foreknowledge. Good bread starts with good flour. You have bad flour, you're going to have bad bread. Well, God's will begins with the flour of foreknowledge. And foreknowledge is absolutely critical in understanding what it is that he's talking about in verses 29 and 30. The argument over predestination, over God's sovereignty versus free will. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But you've got to begin with foreknowledge, and Paul does. The foreknowledge of God. The bottom line is this. There is nothing we've done that he didn't know we were going to do. There's no action we've taken. He didn't know in advance that we were going to take. No choice made, no decision rendered. Nothing that we think we're coming up with on our own can slip past or has slipped past the foreknowledge of God. He already knew. He knew you were going to be here this morning. He knew where you were going to sit. He knew what you'd be thinking about. He knew what songs John was going to choose for worship. He knew Jake would be in flip-flops. Now, everybody knows Jake's going to be in flip-flops. Did you see the picture? I was so proud of you, man. At Don's memorial, in a full suit and flip-flops. I had a tear in my eye when I saw the picture. Foreknowledge. The foreknowledge of God is not like, understand, parental intuition. Where you just know they're up to something. That's not foreknowledge. That's a hunch. Foreknowledge is not an inkling. It is not a guesstimation. God is not weighing the facts that he has against his own feelings. Paul uses the Greek word prognosko. Prognosko, which is foreknowledge. It's where we get our word prognosis. But even our translation, our use of prognosis, medical prognoses are knowledge based on some semblance of fact. Some symptoms. You you look at the evidence and then you make a prognosis based on that evidence that you see. God had no evidence, no fact, nothing seen. He just knew exactly what was coming. Foreknowledge. He knew what you would do. He knew what you would think. He knew what life you would choose to live. I would choose to live. It's absolutely omniscience, the omniscience, the knowing of God. He knows what's going to happen long before it happens because he's already seen it happen. It's one of my favorite things in talking about God and his greatness is we are bound by time. He is not. And I know that's a mind blower, but if you could literally stand outside of time, then you could see everything happening simultaneously. Right? You can see all of time happening at once. It's, it's, the, it's the Goodyear blimp example I've used before and, and you may have heard before. If you're in a Goodyear blimp watching a parade, you can see the whole thing happening at once. But if you're on the parade route, you only see each float as it comes by, one after another, in chronological consecutive order. God is in the blimp. He sees it all. Which is why, marvelously, he can look at you and your failure and your sin and your need, and he can look at Jesus on the cross at the same moment and say, justified. Foreknowledge of God. Isaiah 46, verse 9. The prophet declared, remember the former things long past. God says, for I am God and there is no other. I am God. And there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose, my will, if you will, will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. He's seen it all. History beginning, history ending. Jesus said in Revelation 22, verse 6, it's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, 
Which means history is not a nail biter for God. It is for me. This election season is a nail biter. Well, actually, not so much anymore because at this point I'm like, whatever. Let's just roll the dice and see where we're going to go. But he's seen it all. Foreknowledge. But get this. Foreknowledge, divine foreknowledge, is more than simply knowledge of what's coming. It is knowledge in relationship. Knowledge and relationship. The Hebrew equivalent word that is used throughout the Hebrew Scriptures is yada. And yada not only means to know, but it means to choose. It means to understand. And it means, it's translated, to care for. Consider for a moment Abraham. Keep keep your finger there and go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. God foreknew Abraham. God foreknew Sarah. He foreknew Isaac and Jacob and the children of Israel. And as a matter of fact, in the next section we get to, 9 through 11, you're going to see that. Part of Paul turning and talking about Israel is to give the perfect example of exactly what he's talking about here in Romans chapter 8. God foreknew all of these things. Genesis chapter 12 verse 1 says, The Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you. And I will make your name great And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. He knew Abraham. He loved Abraham. He chose Abraham. He called Abraham. God foreknew exactly what he wanted to do in the life of this man, Abraham. And in calling him, it wasn't like, look, I want you to leave your country and go do this and let's see how it goes. We'll see how everything shakes out. He says, no, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And you know, that's a reality today. There is not a single one of you in here who are not blessed by Israel. And you may not even know it. Technologically. Medically. Socially. Social media, much of what we assume every day as an American invention came right out of Israel. It is absolutely astounding how this postage stamp country, this tiny speck in the Middle East, has impacted the entire world, and yet the world continues to be opposed to Israel. Why is that? Well, I tell you, because Satan's opposed to God. That's the most simple answer. But there's much more to that, because as we'll see in chapter 9, Messiah came through the line of Abraham. Through Isaac, through Jacob, through Judah, through David, on down the line to Jesus. And this entire world is not what it would have been had Jesus not come. This entire world has been blessed, just as God said it will be and would be. And it's going to be, even more so than we can possibly imagine right now. In you all the families of the earth will be blessed. I know you, Abraham. In fact, Genesis 18, verse 19 says, For I have chosen him. The word chosen, yada, I have known him. I've known him, I've chosen him, so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. The point is this, and you go back to Romans. We briefly look at Abraham because God knew him, God chose him, and the foreknowledge of God is personal. The foreknowledge of God is relational. Of the seed of Abraham, that is Israel, God said, Hosea verse thir- chapter 13 verse 5, I cared for you in the wilderness, yada. I knew you in the wilderness. I cared for you. I chose you. I looked after you in the wilderness, in the land of drought. As they had their pleasure, they became satisfied. And being satisfied, their heart became proud. Therefore, they forgot me. What is spoken of Israel there is a picture of humanity. I knew you. 
I knew what you would do. I foreknew you. God chose even to knit you together in your mother's womb to give you life. Have you forgotten Him? He who knew you before you took a breath. The foreknowledge of God is relationship foreknowledge. Now someone might ask the question, okay, so how could Israel especially know God, be known by God, and yet reject God? How could that people do that? It was the Pharisaical problem, and it's a continued problem today in the world. A Pharisaical problem. Jesus said, Luke eleven forty three. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the chief seats in the synagogues and the respectful greetings in the marketplaces, and that's a problem. Paul put it this way: First Corinthians eight verse one. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. He says, if anyone supposes that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. What do you mean, Paul? I mean, if you if you puff yourself up in prideful knowledge, then you really don't know as much as you think you know. But then Paul says this, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. What does love have to do with knowledge? Relationship. The foreknowledge of God who chose to give you life, to give you existence. And now the question for you and for me is, what are we going to do with it? He foreknew you. If you love God, He knew you would. If you reject God, He he knew that too. But just understand this, for every person who's ever lived, before you loved Him, He loved you. And that, to me, is an overwhelming thought. What happened with Israel? They thought they had it down. The leadership thought they knew. They had the law, the 613 commandments. They focused on keeping it, on knowing it. And in so doing, they missed the Father's love. The world forgets that aspect. The world, sadly, will look at Christianity and judge it And be intolerant toward it, saying you're just a bunch of religious people. And they miss the love. Let me ask you, those of you who were at Don's Memorial, was there love here? Is there not love in this place today? Don't you love being around, brothers and sisters in Christ? I don't know what I'd do without you. I don't know what I would do without a family like this. The foreknowledge of God is a foreknowledge of love. And by His foreknowledge, Romans 11.26 tells us, all Israel will be saved. How does that work? Come back next week, we'll talk about it. But like Israel, please know this. As He knew, as He foreknew, and He loved Israel, before Israel would choose Him, He knew you and He loved you and loves you. Before you have chosen Him. If you have chosen Him, you know that. If you haven't chosen Him, guess what? I can tell you two things. He knows you and He loves you. That's our God. That's something of foreknowledge, the first ingredient. The second ingredient, those whom He foreknew, He also predestined. Ingredient number two, predestination. I love predestination. And fully disagree with those who think predestination is how God does everything. What do you mean? Note this, that Paul is not talking about predestination for salvation. He's talking about predestination for conformation. Not confirmation, not to be confirmed, but to be conformed. You have been, by the foreknowledge of God, He knew what you would choose. He knew if you would choose Him or not. And you have been predestined then to be conformed to the image of His Son. God didn't predestine some people to be saved and some people to be damned. That's not how it works. In fact, again, Paul is not even talking about salvation here. And a lot of hardcore Calvinists will miss this one. And I say that with love and affection for my brothers and sisters who have to be Calvinistic. Hey, we love the same Jesus, so praise the Lord. 
And when we get into these arguments or discussions about predestination, salvation is not an issue there, gang. It's just, it's just understanding doctrine. But God predestined my conformation. Knowing in advance that I would accept His calling by His foreknowledge, He set in motion a wonderful supernatural process that would take this natural man and begin to make me more and more like Jesus. You want an example? I am like Jesus in that I will not retaliate for dark deeds done to my office. (laughs) We have been predestined to be conformed. You could call conformation the baking process of the bread of God's will. That we're being conformed. We've talked about this word over and over in this section, this wonderful section of the book of Romans, talking about salvation and sanctification. To be sanctified is to be conformed after the image of Jesus, to look more like Jesus. Not to become Jesus. There's only one of Him, and we will never be Him. And not to be little gods. There's only one God, and I will never be God. But I can look like Jesus. I can love like Jesus. I can share grace like Jesus. I can, I can be honest and truthful like Jesus. That's the best. And I've been predestined because God knew what I was going to choose. He then predestined me to be conformed after the image of Christ. Wow. And to what end? Well, the Apostle John writes in 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared what we will be like, but we know when He appears, we will be like Him. Because we will see Him just as He is. So how does that idea fit with the idea of God's sovereignty? And if you've never thought about these things, this is a debate that is raised on. It's one of the great doctrinal debates of the ages. And wiser, smarter men than I have disagreed with what I'm going to tell you. And I'm going to give you Rick's opinion. It's the right opinion, but I'm going to give it as opinion. (laughs) To the best of my understanding, divine predestination does not exclude self-determination. That is, free will. What God predestined, He does in such a way that I still choose whether or not to accept that predestination. Which is absolutely a God thing. Now again, out of respect and reverence, I believe the hardcore Calvinist might fear that kind of teaching. Might fear or be concerned with the teaching of free will. And maybe you've been in that place. You say, no, I like the sovereignty of God, which says He chooses who's going to be saved, who's not. And it doesn't matter anything that we do. He's already predetermined everything. And I'm just going to sit in that because I'm I'm safe there. I'm comfortable there. Free will freaks me out. Because free will does involve you in the process. Free will does call you to make some choices in how you're going to live your life and who you're going to follow. And so there are those who would say, no, it's not free will, it's sovereignty. Listen, sovereignty without free will is not love. Love always demands a choice, and we know that God is love. God is love. And in His love, and in His perfect sovereignty, He personifies love, and that love allows us to decide what we're going to do with Jesus. And he knew it ahead of time. Which is why knowing what you would choose in this life, knowing what you would choose, he predestined those who choose Jesus to become like Jesus. Does that make sense? And it's actually very simple. You might say, well then why don't some people love him in return? I say this with compassion. But the truth is, people do not reject God over theological or doctrinal disagreements. People reject God, they refuse relationship with God, not because they can't abide His standards or His commandments. They reject Him simply out of rebellion. That's all it is. I don't want to live His way. I don't want to be like Jesus. I want to live my life and I don't want some God out in the heavens telling me how to live. It's just rebellion. That's all it is. 
And Jesus opens that up. He explains that to us. Back in John chapter 3. Just listen to this. Verse 16. Jesus said, you know the verse, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world. Boy, the non-Christian world sees that completely differently. You Christians are intolerant, judgmental bigots. Well, that's not why God sent the Son. It wasn't to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. He who believes in Him is not judged. Listen, he who does not believe has been judged already. How? By the foreknowledge of God. You see, God knows every person that would reject Him. And I'm not talking about right now, in this moment of your life. I'm talking across the span of a lifetime. You see, you need to understand that there are people who will reject God for 60 years, and then finally their heart will break, they'll open wide their arms, they'll receive Jesus, and they'll be saved. And God knows that. And so you may be even in a place right now where you're like, arms crossed, I don't want this stuff, I'm not going to live this way. And you may yet choose Jesus, and God knows you're going to. But he also knows the heart of the man and the woman who will never choose him, who will never accept him, who will never respond to him. And by that foreknowledge, he predestines them too, to the end that they have chosen. And so Jesus says, listen, he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world. And men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Hey, listen, if you come to the light, yes, your deeds will be exposed. Just long enough for Jesus to wash them all away. He says, but he who practices the truth doesn't mean he who's perfect in truth, but he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Understand this again. He foreknew people who would choose him and he predestined them to be conformed, which means the good things that come out of my life are because God is conforming me because he is doing it. And I can't claim credit for that. I can claim credit for the bad things. (laughs) But the good things and the love and the compassion and the kindness, it's Him. It's God at work. And Jesus makes that abundantly clear. The only reason a person doesn't come to God for both salvation and for sanctification is they don't want Him. And God being a God of love says, that's your choice. That's your decision. But choose Him and He will not only save you, He will have, get this, He will have already predestined you to Christ's likeness. Christians, listen, a lot of us strive for sanctification. We struggle with sin that is still evident in our lives. We want to be better. We pray, God, forgive me, I've blown it again. And again and again we go through this and we miss this basic fundamental, fantastic truth that God is at work conforming you whether you realize it or not. He's doing it right now. I mean, not just this morning, but in your life, presently, currently, and you may think, man, I'm just messed up, and God's going, I know, but I'm working on you. I got you. You see, I predestined you to be conformed to the image of my Son, and when God predestines, it's a done deal. And you will. And I will experience that moment when I see Jesus as He is, suddenly I'll go, He did it. All that I thought I would never be able to do, He did. He conformed me to the image of His Son. I just love that. So that why? So that He would be the firstborn, verse 29 continues, among many brethren. Wow! This is amazing. Jesus Christ, God made flesh, wants to be a brother. He counts us as family. Look back at verse 15 of Romans chapter 8. 
For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. No, you've received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Practically speaking, that means Jesus calls us brothers and sisters. Jesus does. He who is God. And the Bible tells us, Hebrews 2.11, both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. If Jesus were to walk in the doors this morning in the flesh and stand up in front of us, we would fall flat on our faces in worship and in awe. And he would put a hand on our shoulder, lift us up and call us brothers and sisters. Family. It's astounding. Why would he do this? It says in Hebrews 2 verse 12 that he says, I will proclaim your name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I, Jesus speaking, will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children to whom God has given me, my brothers, my sisters, my family. And why? Because God's determination, by God's predetermination, we look more and more like Jesus. Being conformed to his image. My brother and I can, can walk through town together and people can see us together and, and go and, and think we were just friends. But the moment we start talking, the moment we start gesticulating and acting like we act, you'd go, oh, brothers. You should watch Ron preach sometime. Go over to Port of Call Church in Anacortes and watch Ron preach. You'd be like, oh, that's really scary. That's really scary. Because that's what Rick does every Sunday. <laughs> because our characteristics are similar. We spent, you know, how many years of our lives growing up together and then living near each other and spending time together. So Ron and I have a lot of characteristics, some that we got from Seinfeld, but mostly that are just natural <laughs> characteristics. I'm telling you. They're just natural characteristics. We look like each other because we're brothers. We will look like Jesus having been conformed to Jesus and people will say, oh, you're family. By the predetermined foreknowledge of God, ingredient number three, calling, calling. Verse 30. And these whom he predestined, he also called. I like that. Jesus called me up. Phone rang. It was Jesus. He called me. The word called means invited. And it's just like your, your cell phone rings. You pick it up. Hey, the bread's risen. It's almost done. I'm about to pull it out of the oven right now. Come and get it. He has called me. He has invited me. He has drawn me. It's Jesus on the beach in John 21. Oh, that morning, one of my favorite mornings on this last tour. We ended our time up in the Galilee on the Sea of Galilee on a beach of seashells and, and sand that could, we don't know for sure, but could very likely be the beach on which Jesus stood to call out to Peter and John and the apostles who were out fishing after the resurrection and say, Hey, have you caught any fish? They're like, No. No. Throw the net on the other side of the boat. Oh, yeah, that'll work. This guy's obviously a master fisherman. And, of course, you know they do. They throw the net over. They pull it in. It is filled, John tells us, with 153 fish. 153. We've talked about that number. In Hebrew numerics, if you take every Hebrew letter for a number, 153 spells out Ani Elohim. I am God. It's amazing. And on that same beach, in that awesome moment, Peter jumps out of the boat. He swims to shore. He gets out of the water just, I think, as the boat is arriving. <laughs> That's my boat. And, and he walks up the shore. And there's Jesus. And you know what Jesus says? I have returned in my glory. Fall down and worship. No. He says, come have breakfast. Come have breakfast. It's just an invitation to a meal. Jesus liked to eat. 
and there on the fire before them, fish was frying, bread was made. Come have breakfast. He calls them. Calling, invitation. By the way, what is the best answer when God calls? I'll give you the biblical answer. Here I am, Lord. Rick, here I am. Glenn, here I am. Skip, here I am. It's the best answer you can give to God when He calls you. Abraham answered that way in Genesis 22.1. Jacob answered that way in Genesis 31, verse 11. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 4, Moses hears the Lord call to him and says, Here I am, Lord. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 4, Samuel says, Here I am, Lord. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, Isaiah says, Here am I, Lord. He got it backwards, but it's still the here I am. In the book of Acts chapter 9, a simple servant in Damascus, a man by the name of Ananias, was sitting in his home one day and the Lord called Ananias and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said, I want you to go to a man named Saul, a killer of Christians, and I want you to baptize him. The best response to the call of the Lord is to say, Here I am. But get this. When a person answers that inviting call of the Lord, something flips. Something wonderful happens. Something changes. Isaiah 58 verse 9 says, Then you will call and the Lord will answer. Then you will say, Father, and He will say, Here I am. Then you will invite and He will be the one. Isaiah says, You will cry and He will say, Here I am. So right now He's calling you. But once you've heard the call, once you're invited, then when you call Him, He says, here I am. He turns it around. He's the one. And by the way, in the coming kingdom, Isaiah tells us, Isaiah 65, 23, it will also come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they're still speaking, I will hear. Foreknowledge, predestination, calling. These are good ingredients. But they seem a little out of order. I mean, did you notice that? Knowing me, he then predestined me. I get that. But after he predestined me, he called me. Wouldn't you think he would invite you first and then predestine you after you've accepted his invitation? No, he predestines you before he invites you. And that is sovereignty. Knowing what I choose, he made certain of my response before giving the invitation and then and only then he called me. Now I can give you kind of a, a, a lame example. It's not quite up to the, the wonder of that. But I knew Cheryl was going to say yes before I asked her. <laughs> and any of you guys getting engaged or thinking about marriage, you want to be sure. Because the last thing you want to say is, will you marry me? And she said, eh, no. No. I think not. Do you want to be sure of that answer? And that's why he predestines before he calls. He makes sure, by his foreknowledge, he assures our response, and then he invites us. He establishes, you might say, he establishes the yes, and then he calls us. And verse 30 continues and says, And these whom he called, he also justified. Ingredient number four, justification. Foreknowledge, predestination, calling, and now justification. And we don't need to spend much time on this because we already have. Romans chapter 3, verse 26. He is both the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That's good news. What does it mean? It means I'm not judged by some... Some partisan judge or political hack. I'm not judged by someone whose judgment is wonky or uncertain. I am justified by the one who is perfectly just in and of himself. He's the one who justifies. He throws away the book. He doesn't throw the book at me. He throws it away. He erases the charges just as if I'd never sinned at all. After he's called me, after he predestined me by his foreknowledge. David cried out. You know the whole situation with Bathsheba. 
and how he had her husband, Uriah, killed in battle because he had had an adulterous affair with her. It was sin of the highest. And David, when he is found out, he didn't confess, by the way, he was, he was outed by the Lord through Natan the prophet. But David, who was a man after God's own heart, when he realized what he had done, cried out to God. Psalm 51, verse 1, he said, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. He cried, he prayed, and it couldn't happen. It couldn't happen until God's righteousness was justly satisfied by the sacrifice of Jesus. But I promise you, the moment Jesus died on the cross, every sin of David's was blotted out completely such that David could be in the presence of the Lord. And all who come seeking God through His grace by faith, He justifies, He makes right, He does it, you don't. He is the great justifier. And so, these whom He justified, He also glorified. In two verses there, Paul gives a recipe that results in number five, glorification. Glorification. All the ingredients are here. Again, think it through. He foreknew. He predestined. He called. He justified. And the end product, He glorified. But did you notice? He glorified his past tense. I don't know about you, but I looked in the mirror and I didn't see glory this morning. (laughs) I'm not exactly a glorious person. (laughs) You will be. You will be. And it's a future certainty that is so absolute, it's written like it's a done deal. In the Bible, that's called a proleptic phrase. It's a phrase that's written as if it's done. Ephesians chapter 2. He has seated us in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He has? I mean, we got nice chairs, but these are not heavenly. I know, after about an hour of teaching, you guys are shifting and moving and everything. But that's not what's going on here. you got to get this. Every one of these verbs, from foreknowledge to predestined to called to justify to glorified, every one of these verbs are in the aorist tense in the Greek. You might want to jot that down. You don't have to understand aorist except this. That means that it can be past, present, or future. Why would Paul use the aorist tense with all these things? Because the foreknowledge of God is past, present, and future. The predestination of God is past, past, present, future. Calling, justification, and glorification is past, present, and future. In other words, this work of the Spirit is done. It is being done, and it will be done. As far as God is concerned, it's done. From my standpoint... I'm still baking. I'm being done. And when it's all said and done, the oven timer is going to ring out like a trumpet in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. Glorified. Paul says in Philippians 1.6, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it in the day of Christ Jesus. And that's a great place to end. But we're not going to. Rick, you said there would be six ingredients, and that's just five. Well, there is one more. You see, number six, you've got to go back to verse 28, which I kind of skipped. And consider this. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. The best ingredient of all is good. God's good. His good. The Greek is agathos. And agathos means good, excellent, praiseworthy. In fact, in Greek thinking, it is what gave life meaning. Plato said it was the central tenet of life. What is goodness? Aristotle called it the golden mean. Philo 
A first century Greek Jewish philosopher said the divinity who is the supreme good is the personal God. Good. Of course, Jesus says no one is good except God alone. Only God is good. And God said to Moses, Exodus thirty three nineteen, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. And, and you remember what happened. He shielded Moses in the rock from being killed by his glory. Because his glory is overwhelming. Moses goes up into the rock. God lays his hand over him, passes by, and removes his hand. And Moses gets a sense of the trailing off glory of God. He gets a sense of God's goodness. It's why, by the way, God had required little golden bells to be stitched around the high priest's robe. That they would jingle when he goes into the Holy of Holies. He would put on this robe, and at the bottom of the robe it had a little pomegranate and a bell, and a pomegranate and a bell all the way around the robe. So he could go into the Holy of Holies and perform the work one day a year on Yom Kippur. And the reason the bells were there is so those on the outside could hear the bells jingling and know that he was still alive. If the bells stopped jingling, they would tie a rope around his ankle and just pull him out. The bell was to signify in the movement of the priest that he was alive. That is the grace of God. By the way, we were in Israel and Eli Shakron. Eli Shakron is an archaeologist. He's been an archaeologist in Israel for 25, 30 years. And some of us got to meet him. We're introduced to him in the parking lot of Caesarea Maritima. And when we were talking, I said, Eli, tell me, what is in all these years, what is the greatest, most significant archaeological find of your life? What would you say is number one? He said, wait a minute. And he ran back to a bus and he came back and he handed me a photograph. I've got it. Of one of the bells from the robe of the high priest. It had fallen down a little channel coming out of the temple mount. It was buried under, you know, years and years of of dirt and refuse. and, And as they have been excavating in 2011, they found this little bell. And they, they're not even sure exactly the date. They know it is, it is at least first century. It may go back further than that. This little golden bell. Well, listen. In the kind intention of God's will, we discover two golden finds right there in verse 28. First off is that all things, gold bell number one, all things work together for good for those who love God. You might want to circle all things because the Bible doesn't say some things. Most things. You're going to have a few that just don't work out well. But most things will. That's not what it says. All things work together for good for those who love God. All things. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.9, Just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love Him. Love God and it is all going to work out for good, even the worst moments of your life. Do you think bread enjoys baking? I mean, if you were a loaf of bread in an oven, Hey man, turn up the heat, we're not quite yet done! And how many of you in your life enjoy pain and hardship and loss and sorrow and heaviness and betrayal and all the things that happen to everybody in life? But the promise is love God and every single thing in your life will work together for good. And I can promise you this from the word of God and by the spirit of God, there will not be a single person in heaven who doesn't look back and say, wow, it really was for the good. When I was in the oven, I hated that season of my life. But I would not change it because look at the good that God has done. All things, lovers of God, there's nothing in your life, good or bad, that you won't recognize as absolutely good. All things work together for good. And the second golden bell, the second find here, is that it's to those who are called according to His purpose. All things according to His purpose. And that is your choice. And and that is my choice. To love God 
who has foreknown you and predestined you and, and called you and justified you and wants to glorify you. To love him who has called you according, please listen, according to his will, not according to your will. According to his will, not according to some pastor's will. According to his will. All things. And this is the bread of his purpose. This is the bread of his purpose. Rick, why do you keep referring to bread? I mean, I I guess you're using that as a little hook point in your teaching. No, I'm not. The word purpose in verse 28. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. The word purpose is prothesis. And prothesis in the Greek is used four times. It's used many, many times, just translated purpose. Four times it is translated as a very specific kind of bread. Four times. Twice are in the Septuagint. You Bible students know what the Septuagint is. It's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. And so two times those, those Hebrew translators who translated the Old Testament into Greek, twice they used this word prothesis when talking about bread. Listen to this. Leviticus 24, 17 says, You shall put pure frankincense on each row that it may be a memorial portion for the bread. The bread, that is the prothesis artus. Artus is bread, prothesis purpose. The prothesis artus. Even an offering of fire to the Lord. Leviticus 24, 7. 1 Samuel 21, verses 4 and 6. In verse 6, again, in that Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures... It says the priest gave David consecrated bread. Prothesis artus. For there was no bread there, but the bread of the presence, which was removed before the Lord in order to put hot bread in its place when it was taken away. That bread was eaten by the priests. That bread was sustaining for the priests. And in the Septuagint, those translators, they said, you know what, this bread that's mentioned here in Leviticus and, and over here in 1 Samuel, this bread, we need to call it the prothesis artus. Why? Matthew chapter 12, verse 3. Jesus, in relating that story from 1 Samuel, says, have you not read what David did when he became hungry, he and his companions? How he entered the house of God and they ate consecrated bread, prothesis artus. It's that word for purpose. They ate the bread of purpose, Jesus said. He called it that. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 2. There was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which there was the lampstand and the table of incense and the sacred bread. Sacred bread? Prothesis artus. The purposeful bread. And this is called the holy place. What's the point? The sacred bread of the presence was also called by Jesus, by the Hebrew writer. It was also called the bread of purpose. Because that bread that was in the holy place portrayed the divine nourishment of God. And pointed to the coming Messiah who again said, I am the bread of life. Jesus, the bread of life, came fulfilling perfectly the will and purpose of God. So that the will and purpose of God would be bread to you, bread to me, nourishment, strength, a sustaining influence in our lives. Our purpose, our bread. The apostles came back to Jesus just outside of Samaria at Jacob's well. Surprised to find him there talking with a woman and then she ups and runs back into the city. Her life would be forever changed. And the apostles come to him and they're saying, Lord, you need to eat something. You got to eat something. John 4.32, Jesus said, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. John 4.34, he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. The bread of purpose. So what is your purpose in life? Christians and non-Christians alike, it's a question you got to answer. What's your purpose? What's the will being worked out in your... Is it your will? Is it the will of another? The will of a husband or a wife or a friend or a business or... Whose will is it? 
To be called according to His purpose means that I keep Jesus on the table. The bread of life. And Colossians 3.4 tells us when Christ who is our life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. Amen. Father, thank You. Thank You that in Your foreknowledge, You chose to predestine us to be conformed to the image of Your Son. Thank You, Lord, for inviting us, calling us. Thank You for justifying And Lord, I can barely thank You for the glorification because it is so mind-boggling to me. It's just beyond my understanding what You have promised to do. But most of all, I thank You for the promise that all things work together for Your good to those who are called according to Your will and purpose. May we be, Father, Spirit of the living God, move in and among us this morning and call us to Yourself. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.